Tene Brahma Hidaya Adikavaye Muyantiat Surayaha Tejo Vari Midam Yata Vini Mayor Yatra Chisago Misha Tam Nasvina Sadadiras the Kuhakam Satyam Parandi Mahi O my Lord Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva, O all pervading personality Godhead, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth and the primal cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations and he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji, the original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion, as one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes, temporarily manifested by reactions of the three modes, appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations in the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma projita kaitravotra paramo nirmatsananam satam vedyam vastavam atravastu shivadam tapa trayon mulanam shimad bhagavate mahamuni krite Kimba Prayer Ishwaraha Sajohidi Avarudyate Tra Krite Vihi Susu Subhistakshanat Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpaturur galitam falam sukamukad amrita dravya samyutam pipita bhagavatam rasam alayam muhur ahoraska buvibhava kaha O expert and thoughtful men, relish Srimad Bhagavatam, the mature fruit of the desire to Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful, although its nectarian juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls. Shimad Bhagavatam, Kanta 1, Chapter 16, Verse Number 11. Huh? We what? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. 
Shinvata Swakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Hiryantak Stopadrani Vidyanati Suhit Satam to hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita is itself a righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, or Krishna who dwells within everyone's health, acts as a best wishing friend and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nasta preesu bhajesu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavati uttama sloke bhaktir bhavati naistiki. In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. By, de by development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance, <clears throat> and thus material loss and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso bhagavat bhakti yogataha bhagavat tattva vijnanam mukta sangasya jayate. When these impurities are wiped away. The candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness, becomes enlivened by devotional service, and understands the science of God perfectly. Thus, bhakti yoga severs the hard knot of material attach, uh, material affection, and enables one to come at once to the stage of some sayam samagram, understanding of the supreme absolute truth, personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Kanta 1, Chapter 16, Text Number 11. Swalankritam, Swalankritam, Shyam, Turanga Yojitam. Ratam Regendra, Dwajam Asritya Purat. Rito Ratasva Pipapati Yudaya Pati Yuktaya Swasinaya Dvi Digvi Jayaya Nigata Nigata Translation by Srila Prabhupada Maharaj Yudit Maharaj Brikshit sat on a chariot drawn by black horses. His flag was marked with the sign of a lion. Being so decorated, surrounded by chariots, cavalry, elephants, and infantry soldiers, he left the capital to conquer all directions. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Maharaj Prikshit is distinguished from his grandfather, Arjuna, for black horses pulled his chariot instead of white horses. He marked his flag with the mark of a lion, and his grandfather marked his with the mark of Hanumanji. A royal procession like that of Maharaj Brikshit, surrounded by well-decorated chariots, cavalry, and elephants, infantry, and band, not only is pleasing to the eyes, but also a sign of a civilization that is aesthetic even on the fighting front. Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai Thai Gora Premanandi. 
So, the civilization and culture of the Vedic and Vedic times was very beautiful, pleasant, artistic, and full of significance. Everything was full of significance down to the last detail. Because uh, the Vedic culture is dealing with the supreme absolute truth, Lord Krishna. It's not based on people's speculation. This is what's very hard for people to understand because we've gone through at least uh, at least five, uh, almost five, almost five thousand years of speculation uh, after the, the uh, disappearance of Lord Krishna, and many times an intervention had to be made by Krishna himself, who, who came as Lord Chaitanya five hundred years ago, or his empowered uh, incarnations, or uh, empowered jivas, uh, in, in order to reset the uh, deterioration of pure dharma, dharmam to sakshat bhagavat pranitam. Only Krishna can announce the path of dharma. And he, therefore he's responsible for its maintenance. And therefore whenever there's a decline uh, in the practice of dharma, he will come in one way or another and put it back right. Especially in Kali Yuga because the deterioration of uh, pure practices and pure understanding happens very quickly in Kali Yuga because of the weak memories of people, because of their addiction, the sense gratification, and so forth. So, um, the Vedic culture uh, is something extraordinary. Why? Because it's based on the words of Krishna. The Bhagavad Gita spoken at least initially over 120 million years ago, but then it was spoken uh, again and again and the last time it was spoken by Krishna himself 5,000 years ago. So this book, this one book, the Bhagavad Gita, is the most perfect uh, or scripture that uh, one can uh, easily access because it's a short book. It's only 700 verses at most. The Srimad Bhagavatam is 120,000 verses. Huh? 18,000. Huh? 18,000, I'm sorry. Yeah, the Mahabharata is 120,000 verses. So we see that there are uh, vast literatures, but the Bhagavad Gita uh, only has 700 verses. One can recite the whole thing in, in two hours, two and a half hours, and you can read it, the whole thing, in, in a week if you uh, put your mind to it. So, therefore, uh, all the themes in the Bhagavad Gita are the quintessential truth of life. So, uh, Prabhupada says, uh, let me just see here. In the fourth chapter, 40th verse, Prabhupada says that Bhagavad Gita is the best of all Vedic literatures. Let's see where he says that. Yeah. Ajnascha Shranadhanasya Samsayat Yamavinasyati Nayam Lokasti Na Paro Na Sukham Samsayat Manaham. But ignorant and faithless persons who doubt the revealed scriptures, do not attain God consciousness, they fall down. For the doubting soul, there is happiness neither in this world nor in the next. And Prabhupada writes, out of many standard and authoritative revealed scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita is the best. Persons who are almost like animals have no faith in or knowledge of the standard revealed scriptures, and some, even though they have knowledge of or can cite passages from the revealed scriptures, have actually no faith in these words. And even though others may have faith in scriptures like Bhagavad Gita, they do not believe in or worship the personality of Godhead. 
Sri Krishna. Such persons cannot have any standing in Krishna consciousness. They fall down. So this is what has happened after the uh, disappearance of Krishna. People began to speculate and they uh, eventually rejected the Bhagavad Gita and wrote their own scriptures and their own interpretations of Bhagavad Gita. In fact, they're still writing their own interpretations in in interpretations of Bhagavad Gita and misleading themselves and other people. Bhagavad Gita is Krishna speaking about himself. There's no one more expert in the subject of Krishna in the spiritual world than Krishna himself. And Arjuna is asking Krishna quintessential questions. In other words, if you met God, you would not be able to think of any other questions uh, to ask than Arjuna did. Arjuna asks every significant question to clear the path of surrender to the Lord. And the Lord takes his time to explain in depth the answer to each one of these questions. If you, if you write down all the questions Arjuna asks, you'll see that they're amazing questions that no ordinary person would think of, uh, or not all of them, in such a sequential way. So therefore, out of many standard and authoritative revealed scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita is the best, that's Prabhupada's statement. Of course, there's Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the sequel of the Bhagavad Gita, which ex expands every one of the themes that Krishna touches in Bhagavad Gita uh, exhaustively, I mean, in, in depth. So, uh, in, in a sense, you'd say the Srimad Bhagavatam is the continuation of the Bhagavad Gita, but with much, much more explanation. It's just like the difference between the Webster's Pocket Dictionary and Webster's International Dictionary. They both have English words that are translated and, and they are uh, defined, but the uh, Pocket Dictionary has very succinct, pithy uh, definitions, and the uh, uh, Webster's International has tremendous elaboration of uh, and history of each word, the etymology of each word, and so forth. So there, there is a difference between the International uh, Webster's Dictionary and the Pocket Webster's Dictionary. In the same way, Bhagavad Gita has the quintessential truths explained uh, in rather you know thoroughly by Krishna, but then there's a huge expansion of it in the Srimad Bhagavatam. So, uh, Prabhupada says in his purport to 440, out of all the above mentioned persons, those who have no faith and are always doubtful make no progress at all. So what is happening in Kali Yuga is very, very clever people are putting doubts in people's minds about the validity of uh, Bhagavad Gita and Vedic scriptures. And this was especially uh, orchestrated by the British in their uh, 200 years or 250 years of ruling in India. And, uh, but it started way before that. And there were Indian speculators, uh, considered by some as saints, who have, uh, let's say, denatured the pure, purity of the message of Bhagavad Gita by changing things, interpreting things, uh, excluding things, etc. There are many different techniques how to mislead people. And therefore, Prabhupada says, one should therefore follow the principles of revealed scriptures with faith and thereby be raised to the platform of knowledge. So what is a revealed scripture? Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Lord Krishna is revealing this knowledge to Arjuna, and Arjuna is the prototype of all of us who is confused about what is the purpose of life and how to attain it, and uh, more or less paralyzed in his effort to follow the spiritual path. And uh, uh, at that point, his saving grace is he surrenders to Krishna and says, look, I don't really know what I'm doing. Uh, I completely surrender to you. So Sanatan Goswami did the same thing. He told Lord Chaitanya, people call me Pandit, but uh, I don't really deserve that name because I don't know why I'm suffering. And, and uh, I'm, I'm going to surrender to you, my dear Lord. I want you to explain to me 
you know, why is it that uh, I am suffering like this? So uh, that's the fundamental question that leads to uh, the desire to get inf uh, bona fide information. When a person is suffering, they will become a little bit desperate to find out, you know, uh, let's say it's a sickness, so they want to find out a cure. And, or, or let's say they are frustrated in their relationships with others and they want to get help to find out how to deal with it or how to uh, correct it. So, but ultimately, people are frustrated by the fact that they're going to get old, get sick, and die. And they're trying to understand what is the actual purpose of life? Why did God make a world like this in which people suffer? Well, God didn't make a world in which people suffer. People have made a world in which they suffer. This is another false argument. It's all God's fault. No, it's not God's fault. And this is a big question that's never been answered properly uh, by any other of the theologians in the past. It's only been answered by Krishna himself in the Bhagavad Gita. So this question of why people suffer, it's, 15th, uh, it's the fifth chapter, 15th verse, in the brilliant purport by Srila Prabhupada. And Krishna clearly says, <clears throat> Nor does the Supreme Lord assume anyone's sinful or pious activities, embodied souls or embodied beings, however, are bewildered because of the ignorance which covers their real knowledge. So what is this ignorance that covers the real knowledge. It's the proclivity for or attraction for sense gratification. This is what is remains. It's the kutam. It's what remains after going through a whole cycle of life. And, uh, and uh, what remains in the subtle body is the attraction or the proclivity towards sense gratification. And when you come into the next life with that, uh, let's say, subtle uh, desire, then uh, Maya plays its tricks. Why does Maya play her tricks on people? Because they don't follow the regulative principles. That's why. Prabhupada explains that in a letter. When people don't follow regulative principles, then their own mind plays tricks on them. Uh, induced by Maya. So therefore, uh, when those tricks start, especially at puberty, uh, one develops, and one begins to experience desires that were unfulfilled in their previous life. They're awakened, especially at puberty, and they suddenly become attracted to things, and they're not even sure why. And eventually, Unless they're trained properly, they will succumb completely to those things and go off track for the rest of their life. That's why education of children is especially important, and especially from the point of puberty, which is around between 10 to 12 years old. And, and, and men, and I mean boys and girls, both go through pure puberty. It's not just girls. And all these desires are awakened in them, and... It confuses them. So if they are being educated by people who are confused, their confusion only increases. If they're being educated by people who know what the truth is, and the truth is Bhagavad Gita. The truth is Bhagavad Gita. Anything that deviates from what Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita is not the truth. Now, most people can't, first of all, they don't understand what, what the, the truth is in the Bhagavad Gita, and therefore they can't understand what is a deviation from the truth. So unless we teach our kids Bhagavad Gita, not simply uh, memorizing slokas, many people, Mayavadis, can, can quote the slokas better than us. That doesn't mean they understand them. So simply... Uh, learning slokas is, is not enough. You have to have deep realization of the slokas. That's why so sometimes people, you know, just read 
the slokas of Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, and you know, people listen to it and they think they understand something. They don't understand anything. I'm telling you right now, they don't understand anything. They don't even remember hardly any of it. Simply listening to the slokas is not enough. You have to hear the purports by Srila Prabhupada because that Prabhupada has distilled the uh, conclusions of, of uh, Krishna and the greatest saints in the history of the world uh, into these purports. So each purport is precious. Prabhupada said they're his spiritual ecstasies. Of course, to get that taste, is, that's an acquired taste, just like someone develops an acquired taste for smoking a pipe with certain types of tobacco, right? And someone develops a taste for drinking wine. And then they learn all these different types of wines and vintages and years and, and, and so forth. And they develop this taste. And people develop a taste for smoking cigarettes. And people develop a taste for eating meat. And people develop a taste for coffee. Nowadays, you walk into Starbucks, uh, you have to read a whole book about coffee before you walk in there because there's so many different types of coffee, you know, uh, and grown in different altitudes and different uh, environments and so forth. Well, we also have to develop a taste for Srimad Bhagavad Gita and for hearing the spiritual knowledge. And that taste is not developed simply by learning slokas. It's developed by very carefully hearing on a regular basis uh, the sloka and the explanation by Srila Prabhupada. So here it says, the Sanskrit word vibhu means the Supreme Lord who is full of unlimited knowledge, riches, strength, fame, beauty, and renunciation. He is always satisfied in himself, undisturbed by sinful or pious activity. So now that right there is a difference between the Abrahamic God and Krishna. The Abrahamic God is disturbed sometimes by what's going on in the material world. And he, he, he reacts to it. But Krishna is never disturbed by what's going on in the material world. Uh, and that's what it said here. It's undisturbed by sinful or pious activities. He does not create a particular situation for any entity, any living entity. But the living entity, bewildered by ignorance, desires to be put into certain conditions of life, and thereby his chain of action and reaction begins. That one statement right there, that one sentence right there, is not understood by most, if not all, philosophers in the West. They all come to the conclusion, not all, but most, come to the conclusion it's all God's fault. And I know many Hindus that have the same conclusion. This one man would uh, discuss a little bit of Bhagavad Gita with me all the time whenever he'd see me. And he said, God made women too beautiful. You know, in other words, his attraction to women is God's fault, right? No, it's not God's fault. By the way, he made women that are ugly also, right? But that doesn't mean anything because even the ugliest uh, man and woman look at each other and say, I never saw anyone as beautiful as you. That's a fact. You know, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. It's not, it's not necessarily certain traits. Uh, the, the beauty of someone in one country is different than the beauty of someone in another country. So it's a relative thing, like everything in the material world. So therefore, this God is, it's all God's fault. Therefore, uh, I'm just going along with it. No. Uh, here it says, he does not create a particular situation for any living entity, but the living entity, bewildered by ignorance, desires to be put into certain conditions of life, and thereby his chain of action and reaction begins. A living entity is, by superior nature, full of knowledge. You see? So, what is the education system today? It's to destroy that knowledge and make the person a victim of Maya. That's what, that is exactly what's happening in these schools. That's why they're so dangerous. They are purposely putting false concepts into the minds of these kids so that they will be exploited the rest of their life by uh, the system, uh, political system. 
In one country, it's communism. In another country, it's capitalism. In another country, it's socialism. In another country, it might be anarchy. In another country, it might be uh, uh, fascism. Uh, does the education system is meant to dumb down kids right from the earliest time, just like in Washington State now, they're passed a law that children should be taught about homosexuality in kindergarten. Did you know that? Is this true, Prabhu? What? It's like, uh, like it's not like elementary, but not, I was not sure it's like that early. <laughs> okay, elementary. No, it's, uh, okay, let's say it starts elementary. That means first grade. Yeah. Okay. So did you know that? Did you know that, Prabhu? There's a law now in this, in this state. They're going to teach your kid about homosexuality in first grade. I, I have an interest, but first I did. Well, you, you're, you're behind. <laughs> <laughs> They're advancing faster than you're, you're knowing. So does it make sense that you should teach a kid in first grade about homosexuality, how it's, it's okay to have two daddies and two mommies? You know, this is outrageous. But that, that's not the only thing. That's just one thing. The many other things they're teaching kids right from the earliest stages to make them uh, not more sensitive about uh, diversity, but make them more uh, uh, accepting perversity. It's not diversity, it's perversity. Right, such as you know, we have the proof that Darwinism is true. There's no proof that it's true, but they treat it like it's true. And if you say one word against it, they say we have the proof. What, what's the proof? Well, it's the uh, it's the uh, uh, the segment of the tailbone in the human being that proves we were all monkeys before. That's a bunch of nonsense. It's not true. You see, so. Here we have uh, a massive organization to destroy faith in God. It's funded, and you're paying the taxes to fund it. Billions of dollars every year spent in this country on educating kids to be atheists. Okay, so, and to educate kids that if there is a God, it's all his fault if there's something wrong. A living entity is by superior nature full of knowledge. Nevertheless, he's prone to be influenced by ignorance due to his limited power. That's the position of our kids. They're easily prone to be influenced by ignorance. It's, it's our problem, too, but we have a little bit more experience when we grow up. But kids don't have any of that experience. They just have the kutam, the tendency to be attracted to material sense gratification. And unless they're educated properly, the school will educate them to be attracted to sense gratification and to go for it and to convince them there's nothing wrong with it. Anyway, this is a big subject, so I'll stop right there. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah. So, Bharat, why does the, the previous desires or previous life desires of karma starts? After 10 or 12 years, is it not like see some kids also have some desires even before they achieve? What is well, I um, mean, you, you know, many people say, Well, my kid was younger, so, you know, he, he came to the temple and he chanted Hare Krishna. Now he doesn't want to come to the temple, right? So there's a certain innocence up to purity, puberty. Not maybe for all the kids, but most of the kids. There's a certain innocence. Okay, give them the microphone. Well, yeah, ask the question again. There's a question. So, question was, Maharaj, why does the 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 desires uh, get well, from the previous desires get invoked during the puberty period? Why not? What are the desires that they have before the? Even achieving the puberty. Oh, they, have, they have certain tendencies. Mm -hmm. and there's two things. One is being born with a demoniac nature. That tendency is there. And the other is awakening of des unfulfilled desires from the previous life. 
which usually happens at puberty. So you have one thing is being born with demoniac qualities, and the other thing is awakening of these desires that usually become very intense at puberty. And then the next couple of years after that, it's very intense. So everything depends on what happens to a child between puberty and 20 years old. That'll determine in a big, big sense what's going to happen to them the rest of their life. Those are the most critical years in the, in the formation of a child. And usually in those years, they're subjected in an intense way to materialistic education. And it's extremely dangerous. And, and they might not recover at all, or if they recover, it's because they have some association with devotees, positive association with devotees. Now, you know, what happened in ISKCON in its earlier years is, is another tragedy because um, many of these kids, in their, even in, as they were children, were uh, introduced to uh, demoniac things in, the, in their gurukuls because of a lack of supervision of the teachers. So everything depends on the teacher. It can happen even in ISKCON. If the teacher is not qualified, uh, it can be catastrophic, the influence on the kids. Yeah. So you, you cannot just give your kid to someone without vetting that person. You can't give your kid to someone to be educated without vetting that person. Because if that person it has uh, all these foibles, these, these contaminations of, of Kali Yuga uh, inherent in them and they practice it, then uh, it's not going to work. It's, they're going to they're transfer it in an in a explicit or subtle way to the kids. Okay. Kids, are, it's, the kids are like Play-Doh, you know, you can sort of, you know, uh, form them into, into different shapes, you know, and, and that's what's happening. They're, instead of a forming the body, they're forming the mind into different shapes by introducing ideas. Just like, why, why would they make it legal to introduce knowledge of, you know, uh, sense gratification in first grade? When, when the kids have no way of dealing with it or, or having a, you know, a background to, to know if it's true or false. So then, then teacher is an authority. So if, if she starts or he starts teaching these type of things in first grade, the, the kid is completely disarmed. And the parent is not aware because they're so busy trying to make a living. They don't have time to be involved directly in the, in the education of the kids. The whole thing is, is, is dangerous, very dangerous. So here it says... Uh, Okay, so does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? I will talk some more about this tomorrow. This verse you should read, 5.15. Read the purport carefully. That is a monumental purport that, that answers some of the most difficult questions of philosophy in the West that have never been answered correctly. And they're answered in that one purport. Haribo, all glories to Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Now, if you doubt what I'm saying, and that's okay, you should doubt it. Read this.